have a little 10 minute break. So everybody stand up, have three big breaks. Let's have a little play away. Just the first verse. That's what we want to do with our lives, isn't it? Every thought, every word, every action will glorify God in our lives. That's what it's all about. Oh, just a minute. Peter, before we get started, the little um, press button is not pressing. Yeah. Oh, now it is. Thank you. Now, we're, in a, we're going to examine a very interesting topic for a while this afternoon, the man Jesus refused to speak to. We're told in the scripture that uh, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. So who is this man, Herod? He desired to see Jesus. He asked him many questions and was silently rebuffed. Who is this man to whom Jesus not only refused to talk, but would not even answer his questions? And uh, when Jesus was mocked by his worst enemies, Jesus still had something to say to them, to the priests, to Caiaphas, to Judas, to Pilate. Jesus spoke to all of these. But who was this man for whom Jesus had no message at all? Interesting question, isn't it? Why was Jesus silent? Well, now, to fully understand Herod, we should recall his attitude toward John the Baptist. We must go back to Herod's earlier life. Uh, he and his two brothers actually were educated in the city of Rome. His father was Herod the Great, the same one who ordered the slaughter of the babies at Jesus' birth. Now, when King Herod the Great, that's the one who ordered the slaughter, his father, died, the kingdom was split between the three sons of whom this Herod was one of them. And uh, Herod Antipas, as this one is known, is called governor, or tetrarch actually, in the book of Luke. And the title king was only a courtesy title because he only had a third of, of the kingdom. 
and to gain support from Jewish subjects, he professed the Jewish religion and he even went to Jerusalem on Jewish feast days and this got the support of the Jews behind him. And when Tiberius became the new emperor in Rome, Herod determined to put himself in good favour. So do you know what he did? He built what was, a, what was a new city on the edge of the Sea of Galilee and called it City of Tiberias, naming it after the emperor. And he thought, oh, the emperor's going to look upon me pretty good now because I've named the city after him. Very, very cunning. And... Uh, there it was on this spot here, looking out over the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus well summed up this man's character. He said, that fox, very, very cunning, as cunning as a fox. He was known for his cunningness. Now, he got married to a girl who grew up in the, in the hills of uh, Petra on the other side of the sea. Uh, the Arabian king Eretus his daughter married Herod and he became related then to the dwellers of this amazing mountain fortress called Petra. Now some time later, Herod was visiting Rome and in Rome he had a disinherited half-brother named Philip and Philip actually lived a very private, very quiet life in Rome and uh, he was married to a girl called Herodias. Now actually this was Herod's niece and Herod's niece was married to Herod's half-brother. Herod now took Herodias from his half-brother and uh, now he angered the king of Petra because to do this, he had to abandon the queen, the, the princess of Petra, who had married him. So he now had an enemy in Petra. Now, John the Baptist started evangelistic meetings, and these meetings were having quite an impact in the community. And Herod was listening. He trembled as John the Baptist called for repentance. Get rid of your sins. And for a time it seemed that Herod might even have taken notice of what John was doing in asking him to repent of his wickedness. Herod feared John, we are told in the book of Mark, knowing that he was a just man and unholy and observed him and when he had heard him he did many things and heard him gladly. He sent constantly for John and asked him advice relating to his life. And he respected John and he carried out many of the things that John had uh, told him to do. And for a while it seemed that he might become a disciple of John. Except for the influence of his new wife, Herod might have come out openly in favour of John. But John knew that Herod was about to marry his brother's wife while her husband was still living. And... Uh, John faithfully told him, that's not lawful, you can't marry this woman. And uh, for a time, Herod feebly sought to loosen the lust that he had for this woman, but uh, she was determined. And uh, she hated John because he was interfering in her private life. And Herodias actually... As the scripture says, the, the Greek translated into English literally means she had it in for him. And so she kept working on her husband. Herod, do you love me? Of course I love you. Then if you would please me, you must throw the baptizer into prison. Oh no, I can't do that. He's a man of God. And she all the more strongly insisted. And Herod, after much arguing and against his will, did what she wanted. Herodias probably feared that uh, the influence of John uh, would cause Herod to divorce her, as John had advised. 
And for some time John languished in a prison now near the Dead Sea, the fortress of Manchurias. But Herodias was not satisfied. She was waiting her chance to get rid of him for good. And so she, she couldn't do it openly, a little bit like Satan in the Garden of Eden. Uh, Eve would have been on her guard if Satan had appeared as a great angel of light and started talking to her. So he, Satan worked shrewdly, working through something else, a way that took her off her guard. And this is what Herodias now did with Herod. She waited for his birthday and there was going to be a big party. And here were military officers, uh, politicians and important people of the community invited to Herod's birthday party. And there would be feasting and drunkenness and Herod would be thrown off his guard. And so she sent her own daughter now to dance because she knew that she could have influence on her daughter and this she, she had it all worked out what she was going to do. I will not bring in one of the, the, the professional dancers. I'm going to bring in my daughter because something might happen now that I can use my daughter in to trap him. And uh, he was dazed with wine and he saw only the revelling guests and the banquet table and the sparkling wine and the, and the shining lights and the young girl dancing in front of him. And in the recklessness of the hour, he wanted to do something that would make him look good in the eyes of all the guests. So uh, he said, ask what you will, Salome, that's the name of the girl, and I will do it for you even if it means half my kingdom. And he was hoping to make a strong impression on anyone here. What a generous man he is. And so she went up to her mother. What shall I ask? Ask for the head of John the Baptist. Now, you know, there's a lesson for us in this part of it. The devil always attacks us in our time of weakness. And this is why the Lord has given us the health message. So we maintain strong bodies and a healthy mind in a healthy body. We may not have reasoned why did we get the health message as, as well as all the other things that God has given. Because do you know that uh, Adventists live 12 years longer than the rest of the population on average around the world? And that's the health message that we have. It's a, it's a message that helps us to have the, the maximum health in our lives, stronger and fitter without getting sick. And my wife and I haven't had the flu or a cold for a goodness knows how many years, not even that much, not one sick day. That's the kind of thing when you follow the health message, what it does for you. And, uh, th but if you allow yourself to, to get lax in certain things, the devil always attacks us at that time. So it's important to keep physical, mental and emotional powers at a very high level so that Satan cannot attack us and be successful. Now if we're overworking, not exercising, overeating, faulty diet, going to bed late at night, uh, these things open the way for Satan to attack us at the weakest moment so that we will give in and make wrong decisions. And in Herod's case, it was the wine, the feasting on the wrong foods, the merrymaking and the dancing that did it. And also, if we allow discouragement and negative thinking to come into our minds, that can have the same effect. And that's why the scripture says we should set our thoughts and affections on things above. And if there's something that's pure, true and honest and just and pure and lovely and of good report, if there's any virtue, anything to praise, think on these things. Don't dwell on the negatives. Now Herod was horrified at the thought of executing John. If one of the guests had dared put up his hand and say, no, no, don't do that, Herod would gladly have spared him. But the guests, of course, were overcome with drunkenness and stupor too. And so although shocked, nobody said a word. And Herod waited, but nobody raised a defence for John. And soon the head was brought in on a plate. 
and Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us that she spat on it and fed it to the dogs. That's how much Herodias hated John. And Herod, as he thought back on all this later, John's life, John's earnest appeals, his advice, and uh, he could find no peace of mind. He had done many things and heard John. He knew now that he had done wrong. It was working on his conscience. And uh, he then, a little while later, he began to hear about this man who was preaching around Galilee and, and calling people to repentance. Oh, has John risen from the dead? And he was frightened. And uh, later on, as he heard more about Jesus, he realized this is not. This is the man that John the Baptist was preparing for. He is the one now. Oh, John used to come and interview me. Maybe I can get this Jesus to come and interview me and I can, I can get some good, good information from him and maybe that will ease my conscience. And eventually Herod would have that opportunity. And he'd have it, have it within 12 months of having killed John the Baptist. He was visiting Jerusalem at Passover time, staying at the Maccabean Palace, and Jesus was brought from Pilate's judgment hall now to Herod. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent, but he didn't have the courage to, to stand up. And so he said, I'll pass him on to Herod because Jesus came from Galilee, Herod's in Galilee, okay, let him go over to Jesus, uh, to, to, let him go over to Herod. And so he was. And the scripture says that when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad for he was desirous to see him of a long season because he had heard many things of him and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Herod thought that if Jesus was given a chance to uh, be free, he might work a miracle and so satisfy Herod's conscience. And there was a large company of priests and people who hated Jesus who came along with Jesus to Herod and they were all speaking against him. But Herod didn't take much notice of them because he was wanting Jesus to do something. And uh, he said, loosen his chains. And so they did. Prove by a miracle that you are the Christ and I will set you free. Herod was irritated by Jesus' silence. Jesus said nothing. Now why did Jesus say nothing to Herod? Not even one word. Remember his original attitude to John? Herod's attitude to John? He sent constantly for him. He almost accepted fully. How did he sink into rejection that Jesus wouldn't talk to him? Well, he did many things, but he would not go all the way. He still wanted to hold on to Herodias. He was religious up to a point until the sacrifice came in to follow God. His heart became hardened by continually holding on to something he knew he shouldn't. And so Jesus would not do a miracle just to gratify his curiosity. Jesus said he had come to heal the brokenhearted. He would work miracles to, to save lost souls and save people who were sick. Jesus loved people and he would only work miracles to benefit people that way. And he would not work a miracle to uh, just satisfy curiosity or to help himself. He might have spoken words that would have pierced Herod, but no. <coughs> Jesus knew that Herod had, by clinging on to a known sin and holding on to it and holding on to it and holding on to it, he had hardened his heart to the Holy Spirit's working and nothing Jesus could say would make any difference now. But Christ's silence was a, a rebuke and this actually made it worse for Herod. He had heard and rejected the greatest prophet, John the Baptist, 
he had rejected the light that God had given him, so no other message that he could ever receive would have helped him. So Jesus remained silent. Now Herod became angry. When he saw that Jesus would not say a thing, he turned against Jesus. And he got them to put a a royal mock robe on him and to put a crown of thorns on his head. And as this was going on, Herod was convicted. As they were mocking Jesus, Herod was convicted all the more. And he said, I don't want him here anymore. Take him back to Pilate. And so Jesus was whisked away back to Pilate. Now, five years later, King Eretus of Petra, his ex-father-in-law, decided he would have payback time against Herod, who had ditched his daughter. And he invaded Herod's kingdom and took a third of it away from him. And three years after that, the new emperor of Rome, Caligula, actually made Herodias' brother a king. Now Herodias was jealous. She said, look, you're still only a tetrarch. Come, Come with me to Rome. We'll ask that the emperor give you the same title of king. But Agrippa, who had been the the, 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 uh, ruler of this other area, had already told the emperor that Herod had done some treasonable things that he should be punished for. So when Herodias and Herod got to Rome, instead of Herod being rewarded, the emperor banished Herod to France and his territory was given to Agrippa, who had accused him. In the south of France is where Herod was to end his life. And uh, it's very, very interesting that um, Jesus warned against the sin of Herod, putting love of the world first. And Herod was ultimately struck with sores, his body being eaten by worms, and putrefied while he was still alive. Very sad. And he died in great agony of mind and body. Now Herod was willing to follow what was right up to a point. And that point is where the sacrifice came in. Now friends, that's not the kind of a Christian experience God wants for us, that we will take what is good and we'll come and worship on Sabbath and we will sing songs and we will pray, but we want to still hold on to things that are abominable to God because we just don't want to sacrifice anything. There's a lesson for all of us, isn't there, in that? Okay. Love of the world, love of himself held him a prisoner. Now let's Fast forward this to our day. Is there a lesson here for us? Can we see symbols here which are being repeated in the world at large today? Yes, I believe we can. That's what we'll do now. Herod represented the kingly powers, the civil powers, the government. Herodias, the mother, came from Rome. She represents the Roman Catholic papacy who calls herself the mother of all churches. Salome, her daughter, represents fallen Protestants that are following back to Rome. Now the Bible talks about a woman being a symbol of a church. Right through the Bible where symbolic prophecies are given, woman represents church, beast represents political power, a woman riding on a scarlet coloured beast represents a church steering the the government. Uh, We know all those symbols and the book of Revelation does explain itself very well that way. It calls 
a church located in Rome, which is the most powerful in the world, as being the mother and that her daughters are playing the harlot with her when they actually should be following the Bible. And in the book of Revelation, she's called the mother of harlots. And from Martin Luther, who was a Roman Catholic priest, and his eyes were opened to others, John Wesley and Sir Isaac Newton and others, they all recognised that the mother of harlots sat in Rome, just as the Bible said, and that the daughter churches came out of her as daughters come out of the mother, but that they were going to go back to mother and play the harlot. Now, Rome admits that she is the mother. Notice this. Vatican document reaffirms their stance on all the churches. The Dominus Deus Declaration says the Roman Catholic Church is the mother of all denominations and that it is incorrect to refer to the Church of England and other Protestant churches as sister organisations on a par with Rome. She's the mother, they're the daughter, she says. Exactly as the scripture says. So Herod represents the government powers. Herodias, the papacy, the mother from, who came from Rome. And Salome, her daughter, represents fallen Protestantism. John the Baptist represents God's faithful people who give the, gave the same message as John. The scripture says that um, as John prepared the way of Jesus for his first coming, so God's faithful people will prepare the way for Jesus' second coming and they will give the same message, repent, get rid of the sins that, that, that are abominable to God, give up the ways of the world that are fighting against God in your life. But not the spirit of Satan, the spirit of God must control you, totally, 100%, and God will not share himself with, with Satan. That's the message of John the Baptist and that's the message that God gives to his people to proclaim to the world today as the new world order takes over. And John's message was prepare the way of the Lord, repent, get your life in order. And that's God's message today. Prepare for Jesus' second coming. Glorify God. First angel's message. Fear God and give glory to him, glorify him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. That's quoting the Sabbath commandment. So in the last days, God will have a message going to the world which is quoting the Sabbath commandment which everyone has forgotten. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. And do this because God's going to judge us by what his word says, whether we uh, love him enough to obey him. But today, those that have come out of, of, of uh, the mother church are spiritually fallen. That's the second angel's message in Revelation chapter 14. Do you know that Martin Luther believed that that message would be given to the world 300 years after his day? And it was 300 years after his day that the message began to be given, just as prophecy said. John Wesley said it was about to ha come soon after his time. And he died in the late 1700s and the message began in the early 1800s. So prophecy was fulfilling and these men of God recognised it was almost about to start. Well, we're living in the days when it's going. This message is going to the world. And the third message is, come out of her, my people. Don't follow the ways that are offensive to God. Sunday came from sun worship and Rome admits that she gave it to the world and the Protestants who follow it are following her, not God. Oh yes, they boast about it. And you say, well, Rome, did you do it? Yes, who else would dare do it? And so Herod represents the physical, gov the physical powers. Now just as Herod sought the favour of the Jews, the president of the largest and most powerful nation on earth today, not the largest but the most powerful, he is also seeking the favour of the Jews. Isn't that interesting? Just recently, a few months ago, December the 7th, he said, we will move the American embassy to the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Jerusalem. And that was a smack in the face for the Muslims who have the Muslim Dome of the Rock on, on, the, on the mountain. And he did this because 
his daughter is married to a Jew and he wants to get the favour of the Jews. Okay. Now, he says we're going to move, the, move the, our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Okay. And when he said that, throughout the Middle East it was just as though all hell had broken loose. And the Muslims actually were saying, for world peace, Israel must be destroyed. Israel, your days are numbered. Americans, we are your dead. Because America wants to support Israel now. And thousands took to the streets to burn the United States flag. And the president of Turkey said, this will plunge the region and the world into a fire with no end in sight. He made a threat and he quoted Muhammad, we shall kill every Jew. They're not going to participate in a country where Jerusalem is the capital of the Jews. No, we're going to kill every Jew. We're going to take the world for, for uh, Muhammad, for, uh, for uh, Allah. And the president of Turkey says, we are now setting up the third Muslim empire. Now the Bible speaks of them as three woes. The Muslims speak of them as three jihads. And Turkey says, we're going to lead the world to do this. We are north of Jerusalem. We're going to do this now. We're going to come down to Jerusalem and set up Jerusalem as the, as the Muslim capital of the world and we'll kill every Jew if we, uh, to, to get, make this happen. Now, is this a, uh, here's a question. Will this expedite the election of their caliphate that they're announcing? and then rally army of Israel to take over Jerusalem. We know that Rome will eventually take over when Islam is destroyed, but it does tell us that Islam is going to do its third jihad first, and Jerusalem is going to be involved. Okay. Now, what about the... Uh, never mind. Dancing to the Mother Church's agenda. Let, let's look at Salome now. She danced to her mother's agenda, didn't she? Did Salome do that? The mother called in Salome, Salome danced, and she went to her mother to say what's, what's going to be the result. And she let the mother tell her what she wanted her to do. Now on October the 31st last year, Apostate Protestantism danced to the tune of the Mother Church's agenda and the Pope and the leader of the Lutheran Church which began the Reformation signed an agreement that they have no differences anymore. We've come back to Mother Rome. It, there's nothing to separate us. No more protesting. And uh, also the leader of the charismatic movement did the same. He said, no more protesting. Now remember when Salome came to her mother, she said, uh, he had asked, he had, the, the, the government leader, Herod, had said to the daughter, ask what you will and I'll give it to you, even unto half my kingdom. And Trump says now, as the government, goes to the Pope and says, we will do your wishes. Oh yes, Trump says, we shall fight for Catholics. These are his actual words. He also says, I'll support the evangelicals' agenda. So what he's saying is here, we're going to get your, you're going to get your voice back and we'll do what you say. And Copeland, spokesman for the evangelicals, has made a statement that, that is actually mentioned in Revelation chapter 13 and now we see the first fulfilment of it. What did he say? I have a direct line to deliver messages from God to the President Trump and I'm going to exercise my power to do this. The Bible says he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. Now a beast being a political power and the Vatican being a political power as well as religious. Uh, political America says I'm going to cause the earth and then that dwell therein to worship this first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now the deadly wound was healed when Martin Luther broke away 
and started saying, follow the Bible, follow Jesus, don't follow the Pope. That was the beginning. That was the religious wound. And then in 1798, the political wound was inflicted when uh, Napoleon's General Berthier pulled the Pope off his throne, threw him into prison and says the papacy is dead. But then in 1929, the political wound was healed when the Pope was given back his physical territory. And in October the 31st, 2017, just a few months ago, the, the religious wound was healed when the leaders of the evangelical movement and, and the Lutheran movement all came together and says, we will now come back to Rome and do what the Pope says. There's no more difference. And that deadly wound was now healed. In fact, the, the fact that that was a deadly wound inflicted by Martin Luther and by Napoleon's general was stated in the newspapers when it happened. And the fact that the deadly wound is healed in 1929 and again now the, the religious aspect in 2017, both times the newspapers have said the wound is now healed. They're using the same language that the Bible prophecy said would be used. The deadly wound is healed. And then the leader of the Angelicals, Copeland, fulfilling a Bible prophecy in Revelation 13, speaking about the, the Protestant power of America coming back to Rome, he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven and the earth in the sight of man. And what did uh, this man say? By the way, at Pentecost, so if you want to know what a symbol means, you go, you go to the first time it's used. The Bible says that at Pentecost the Holy Spirit came down as fire from heaven. And now this man, Kenneth Copeland, says, I am appointed by God to bring down fire from heaven in 2018. Fire from heaven. That's not God. This is the counterfeit. And then he says there's going to be persecution on those that don't step into line for my, our one world government. I'm appointed by God to bring down fire from heaven and burn up the chaff. In other words, I'm threatening to get rid of those who protest and continue the Reformation. And just as John the Baptist was thrown into prison, so we're told in the scripture that many of God's faithful servants will be treated to, as John was and as Jesus was treated. Many will end up in prison because of their faith. We must not be afraid of what might come upon us. We've got to fearlessly give that message. And, uh, and I, I would say this, friends, that if you fear God, which is in awe of God, you will never fear man. You, it won't worry you what men try to do to you because you know you have eternal life in his kingdom. Amen. And uh, God's faithful servants will be treated as John was. And did you know that they'll also be beheaded as John was? Oh, the, 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 these parallels are enormous. What does it say in the scripture? I saw the souls of them that were what? Beheaded. What happened to John? He was beheaded. And now we have the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. Those who refuse to follow the mark of the beast, many of them are going to be beheaded for their faithfulness to God and they'll be beheaded by the union of church and state, where the churches say, all right now, we're going to have one great world church of which the Pope is the, the, the head. They're talking about it now. And he says, and he says I'm going to do it. And, and it's no imagination anymore. It's being planned. And we're going to use the government to enforce our laws. And uh, those laws include the mark of the beast. And, and many who are punished by these, the civil powers for not following the laws of the church are going to be beheaded. But 
great is their reward in heaven. Now, what's God's answer? Well, what was God's answer to Herod? Out came, the Bible says that sin is like a saw ready to burst out. Doesn't it say that? Doesn't that text in the Bible? A noisome and grievous saw. That's what sin is like. Uh, and uh, just as Herod had clung on to sins he did not repent of, he died with gro- grotesque sores coming out all over his body. So, the Bible says, once the mark of the beast is enforced and many of God's people are thrown into prison and others ha- have, their, have their, uh, their heads cut off, and by the way, in America now, they're talking about introducing the guillotine. Did you know that? Guillotines are being imported into the United States now and there are lawyers who are saying this has to be the new way to do things, cutting off people's heads. Oh yes, this is officially being proclaimed in America. And Australia. And Australia. Thank you. Very good. Well now that's the beginning of what's going to be a global thing. And it's, it's not the French Revolution only. That was only a precursor of what's going to come at the end. And uh, God's answer to them is the seven last plagues. And what's the first plague? I heard a great voice out of heaven, out, out of the temple, saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. See how God's answer fits what man is doing. God's answer, the seven last plagues, the first of which is a noisome and grievous sore. And that goes upon everybody that accepts the mark of the beast at the end time. Then we have the promise of Jesus. Lo, I am with you, even to the end of the world. In other words, no matter if you do have to suffer for Jesus, he's with you. We rejoice as we partake of his sufferings because after all he's done for us, is there anything too great for us to do? Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. In other words, you dwell with God. You dwell with God in your your secret chambers at home. You dwell with God everywhere. And your whole spirit is lifted up to him. So you live for him. You love to praise him. You love to hear about what he does in the world. You love to share the wonderful things about the wonderful Saviour. You love to hear what others are what, how other people's lives are being changed. You love to see the, the changing of people's lives that you share with. You just love Jesus so much that you love everything about him. And you are dwelling, you're living, you're living for him. You're dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. Beautiful. And you shall, because of that, you'll abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Isn't that wonderful? You'll abide under his shadow. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. Now do you know, friends, um, I've got a, a story from California, USA, the other day, just a few weeks ago. After the, the big forest fire had, had gone down, people were, uh, uh, firefighters were coming through an area that was totally charred and, and, and burnt. And uh, there at the bottom of a tree, they saw the charred body of a bird. And uh, under that charred body, uh, they, they, they kicked the body, They kicked it aside and under that there were four little live chickens chirping away. Now that mother bird and her chickens would have been up in the tree, in the nest. But she knew, she instinctively knew that smoke rises 
and that if she stayed up there, they would all die. So what did she do? She brought her little babies down to the bottom of the tree where there'd be no smoke and she covered them, hurt them with her wings and saved their lives and she did so by doing exactly what God promises to do to his people. And uh, he, he also says, his truth, we saw that in the last picture, his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Now, the shield is like the wings protecting you. His truth will protect you from Satan overcoming you. No matter what people do to you, no matter how terrible uh, the persecution may be in the future, you follow the truth. His truth will be your shield. It will protect you. And do you know what? Josephine and I at home, we, every, every night almost, we are reading uh, aloud to each other stories. She does most of the reading. I just love to listen. <laughs> the stories of people who have chosen not to violate God's commandments and as a result, then a man chose not to, not to travel on the Sabbath by flying and as a result, he missed the crash that that plane may had on the Sabbath day a girl who was working at a clothing factory in New York. She chose not to work on the Sabbath. While she was home, well, she went to the park to spend the day on her own and, w and when she got home, she heard that that factory had been burnt down and most of the people in it were burnt to death because the, the boss had, had, had locked the fire escape to keep them to work. His truth will be your shield. You follow God, he'll look after you. I could tell you many more stories like that. Follow him, don't give in. His truth will protect you. Isn't that wonderful? That's right. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. This is describing the seven last plagues. A thousand shall fall at thy sight and ten thousand at thy right hand but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Isn't that wonderful? For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample underfoot. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. With long life, that's everlasting life, will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Glory, hallelujah. hallelujah. And finally, be thou faithful unto death, if it has to be, that you die for your faith. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. God bless you all. Stay faithful. Yes. Show that you love him even if you have to die and he loves you. He loves you so much he would have died for you if there'd been only you were the only person that needed it. He would have done it for you. God bless you all. Uh, Peter, would you like to come forward? Thank you. Peter's working behind the scenes all the time, making sure everything runs smoothly and we don't realise just how much Peter's doing all the time, but thank you, Peter. Shall we kneel where we can? Father in heaven, Lord, we kneel before thee. Lord, we recognise as we have been through this study this afternoon of your great love to us. 
We recognize your call upon us as individuals. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful hope and this assurance that even though there will be trials, even though there will be difficulties, even though, Lord, we will be tested all the way through, mm -hmm. if we will but hold on to thee, if we will but look to thee and study thy word and take it into our hearts, mm -hmm. that, Lord, you will give us courage and strength and faith as you gave it to the worthies of old. Mm -hmm. Lord, we pray this will be our experience. Give us hope and courage, we pray, not in ourselves, but in the salvation and the power of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen.